We will take a, a look at this passage that Sandy just read for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God. Thank you that you have given us direction, instruction. You make sense out of the world around us. You make sense of what we, we feel and experience in our own hearts and minds. You explain what's going on. Lord, you give us direction. Show us the way to life, the way to victory, the way to peace and wholeness the way to be fulfilled and be all that you have called us to be and created us to be. Heavenly Father, I pray for the enabling of your spirit as we look into your word, that it would come alive in our hearts, that it would accomplish your purpose in our lives. And I ask that you would enable me, that you would speak through me, May I put no confidence in my flesh, but Lord, depending upon your spirit. And we pray that we would be built up and strengthened and encouraged to go out from this place into our homes, into our workplaces, our schools, uh, the world all around us to minister the life and love of Jesus Christ, to bring hope, to bring healing to bring deliverance and salvation, to set captives free, to open blind eyes. Lord God, I ask that you would uh, empower your church uh, to be effective in working the works of faith and performing the labor of love while we wait in hope for your return. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thursday night, a number of you were gathered here and had the privilege of spending a night with the persecuted church, a presentation that was made by an organization uh, that ministers to persecuted Christians around the world, an organization known as Open Doors, uh, was founded by uh, Brother Andrew uh, of God Smuggler many years ago. And they confirmed that uh, opposition to the gospel is intensifying all around the world. And it was encouraging just to see and hear testimonies and see how God is working in lives. Uh, in conversation, though, with one of the representatives after the meeting, I was told that for the first time in their history, they have begun monitoring Canada uh, because they see uh, growing signs that we are on the verge of becoming a nation that is hostile to the gospel. Uh, they have not yet put us on their watch list, but for the first time, they're watching us. Um, how should we respond to the opposition? And I, I, I gave that opening just to... Um, I want this to be practical, and as a church, I, I want us to be proactive in looking at God's word, looking what's happening around us in the world, and uh, seeing where we are going, and uh, to look at God's word and say, okay, Lord, we see these things coming. How should we live uh, in this context, in this setting? How should we respond to opposition of any kind? How should we pray for those who are persecuted? Do we just simply pray, uh, Lord, get them out of it? Or is there more to it? Does opposition to the gospel uh, stop the spread of the gospel? Is there hope for our children's faith? I hear this from you often. What about our children? growing up in this world? Do we even want to bring children into this world? Is there hope for our children's faith growing up in a hostile environment? By the end of this study, I trust that you will uh, have some exciting biblical answers to these questions and more. I came across a poem this week. Actually, it's one I dug up that I've 
I've often read and am being encouraged by a poem by Amy Carmichael. And in the poem, she, she prays, O Lord, deliver me from prayer that asks that I may be sheltered from winds that beat on thee. Keep me from fearing when I should aspire, from faltering when I should climb higher, from pampered self, O captain free, your soldier who would follow thee, from subtle love of softening things, from easy choices and weakenings. That's not how spirits are fortified. Not that way went the crucified. From all that dims thy Calvary, O Lamb of God, deliver me. Give me the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no disappointments tire, the passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sink to be a clod, but make me your fuel, flame of God. Amy Carmichael would have made a, a good Thessalonian. Uh, let's, let's look at Acts chapter 16 again. Uh, it's the background for this uh, letter that was written to the Thessalonians. And it just helps us understand what's going on in this letter, if we can be reminded of, of uh, how it all began. Acts chapter 16 and verse 20. And they brought uh, Paul and Silas to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. A description of persecution, uh, a rather extreme form of persecution for the sake of Jesus. But we read on, verse 25, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, and singing hymns to God. Uh, songs of joy, not laments of sorrow. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loose. This is the, the power of God acting in response to faithfulness in suffering, in response to joyful praise and prayer of, of confidence and hope. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's the power of God in response to the prayer of his people, empowering and enabling the, the spread of the gospel. God, God shook that prison to set the prisoners inside that prison free, and now it is the speaking of the gospel that's going to set this jailer free. So they said, verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You will be free. You and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and immediately he and all his family were baptized. And then the next day they, they went from there, uh, traveled by foot to 
uh, Thessalonica, where they preached the gospel for several weeks with amazing results, and many Thessalonians coming to faith in Christ as a result of, of their proclamation in that city. But there was strong opposition right from the start against the gospel in Thessalonica so that Paul and Silas uh, were finally uh, forced to flee for their lives along with their apprentice Timothy. However, shortly after, they were concerned for this new fledgling church and Timothy was sent back to check up on the church and after spending some time with them, he brought back to Paul and Silas great reports of a thriving church defying all odds and growing rapidly in the face of severe persecution. And so we return to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And in verse 1, or sorry, verse 2, uh, they write, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And then verse 5, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. So we looked at that last week. And so today, we're going to look more closely at what the power of God uh, working by his Holy Spirit in these believers looked like. And verse 6, And you, as Paul, Paul, Silas, and Timothy writing to the Thessalonians, Thessalonians, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So when Paul and Silas arrived in Thessalonica, they were still uh, in a lot of pain. They were still recovering from the wounds of the beating they had received in Philippi. And now they were again facing strong opposition for their message. And the people they were preaching to could see firsthand what Paul and Silas had already experienced. And they heard from their testimony what they had been through. And they could tell by the the, the growing antagonism of the crowds around them, the population around them, their relatives, their families, as they would talk about these things, they could see firsthand that opposition was mounting here too against them. They knew what they were going to face if they chose to follow the teaching of Paul and Silas. In the natural, this threat, this danger, this risk would have intimidated and scared away anyone from following this gospel. And yet, in the face of such threats and such personal risk to themselves, not a few, but many of the people chose to follow Paul and Silas. Many of them chose to embrace this outlawed message, not secretly in their hearts, but publicly stepping out to follow these missionaries and to share in their sufferings for the sake of Christ. And as they did it, the Holy Spirit not only saved them, but filled them with joy. He didn't deliver them from the suffering. He didn't deliver them from the opposition. But he filled them with joy in the midst of it. And that became a powerful a tool of evangelism. That became a powerful testimony to the people around. The Bible repeatedly teaches us that suffering is part of the package that must be considered when choosing to follow Jesus Christ. An integral part of Paul's teaching to new believers, um, as we read in Acts 14.22, was this. He says, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus had said, come follow me. Take up your cross, follow me. Deny yourself, follow me. Suffering because of our faith in Jesus doesn't always come immediately like it did for the Thessalonians. Uh, sometimes it follows uh, Years later, but sooner or later, the opposition will come. Turn to Mark's Gospel, 8th chapter. We're just going to look at a few of 
examples in Scripture of what I had just said, that uh, suffering is part of the package of involved in following Christ. Mark 8, verse 34 and 35. When Jesus had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And then John chapter 15, verse 18. Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. You see, when we come to follow Jesus Christ, uh, we are transferred out of the kingdom of Satan who is the enemy of God, and we are placed into the kingdom of God, the family of God. And we have entered into a battle. It is a battle between the enemies of God and those who belong to God. And the enemies of God hate him, hate God. And it's... We have, we have this mission, we have this assignment where we are to go into the world, into enemy territory, and set captives free, release hostages, um, deliver those who are in bondage, who are held captive by the enemy. Uh, they are enemies of God that we are setting free, uh, but setting free that they might come to the Lord, setting free unto salvation of Jesus Christ. And yet, until they have been set free, they are not going to be uh, on amicable terms with you when you come uh, towards them. As Jesus suffered rejection and hatred from many whom he had come to save, so did his followers, just as he had warned. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21 We read this, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. It's part of the battle. It's part of what happens in warfare. Verse 21, for to this you were called. To what? Called to suffer and take it patiently. That's what you were called to. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. And Paul, when he was Saul, uh, called to uh, Christ. um, Barnabas was sent to him to uh, reveal to him from the Lord uh, what things he must suffer for the sake of the gospel. Do you think to yourself when you read these things that I could never handle persecution? I don't think I could do that. Well, here's some good news. The ability to endure persecution Uh, is a gift from God. Just as I said, um, persecution, suffering for the sake of the gospel is part of the package. Well, there's something else in that package. Included in that package is the power of God to endure to the end. That is part of the, the gift of salvation. When you're born again, the Lord puts within you the wherewithal known as his spirit to finish what he started in you. So 1 Thessalonians again, verse 7. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Paul writing, Paul, Silas, and Timothy writing, um, 
You Thessalonicans became examples to all in Macedonia. The expression, you became examples, implies more than just setting a good example for someone else to emulate. It implies that they became an influential pattern that shaped and inspired others everywhere that the word of their testimony was heard. So it wasn't just you're set up as an example, but uh, more like the influence of, of a celebrity or the influence of a, a sports superstar on, on the child that has just watched him score the, the championship winning goal. Um, you are an inspiration that motivates and influences others is what they, they are saying in this letter. You became examples, motivating inspiration to all in Macedonia and Achaia. As they were persecuted for their faith, the Thessalonians, like Paul and Silas, had, uh, when they responded to uh, the, the whipping and the beating that they had received with joyful proclamation of the gospel, um, so had the Thessalon Thessalonians. When Paul and Silas uh, came to them with their testimony of what they'd been through, they were an inspiration to the Thessalonians and... Then the Thessalonians, as they were persecuted in turn, uh, began joyfully sharing their testimonies, which were used by the Holy Spirit to profoundly influence many to believe. Uh, as you study what is written about the Thessalonians, uh, their testimony and their witness spread all throughout the area of Macedonia and Achaia and beyond. Uh, they saturated those areas with the gospel. In fact, it seems that it was not Paul and Silas and Timothy who had the, the most influence in that area with, for the gospel. It was the Thessalonians who this new church of believers who had just saturated the place quickly with the, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and this had happened within a year's time. It was very quick. This was truly a great move of God that was being fanned into flame by persecution and prayer. And we read on in verse 8. For from you, Thessalonians... The word of the Lord has sounded forth. And that word sounded forth is, is like a trumpet blast. It's like a uh, claps of thunder. It is sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. So there's two influences simultaneously going forth here, uh, being spread everywhere by the Thessalonian believers. They were proclaiming the word of God. That is, the gospel was being shared everywhere. And at the same time, they were sharing their testimony, their personal testimony of what God had done in their lives and what they were experiencing and the, the joy that exuded from them with such strong influence that wherever the witness of the Thessalonian believers was proclaimed, Paul, Silas, and Timothy didn't have to proclaim the gospel in those places. The Thessalonian influence was already bearing a fruitful harvest everywhere they went. And verse 9, for they themselves declare, that the people that we're hearing this news from are declaring concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. So the Thessalonians have told them about how Paul and Silas had come whipped and beaten from Philippi and probably told about the earthquake that had broke the prison open and they, they came into our city and they were joyful and they were proclaiming this message and let us tell you what the message was. And when we believed this message, we were whipped and beaten or persecuted, whatever the opposition was against them. And yet it is a life-changing message that we have to proclaim. Everyone was talking about how the message was so powerful that these Thessalonians abandoned their idols. That's what the Bible said there in verse 9. What was the, the focal point of interest? These Thessalonians have abandoned their idols. Idols can be religious, as many of them were for the Thessalonians. 
But an idol can also be non-religious, as they predominantly tend to be in, in our secular society. An idol is really anything that we place in our life as a substitute for the one true God. Anything that we look to other than God for getting our needs met. Anything that we look to other than God for providing a sense of identity. Anything we look to to, to give us purpose and fulfillment and joy in life other than God is an idol. Trusting in money and materialism to meet our needs is probably one of the biggest idols of our culture. And it was a big one in their culture too. Trusting in performance in, in sports or our performance in music or performance in a career to give you a sense of importance, love, and acceptance is a non-religious idol. If you would really struggle with the idea of giving up uh, your sports, okay, give up your sports. Oh, man, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I, just, I live for my sports. That's, that's an idol in your life. Um, give up your your career. Oh, I can't give up my career. Can you give up your possessions? No, I can't give up. Those are idols. When they're things, I need those things. I live for those things. They, they are what give me purpose and security in life. Take those away and, and I'm insecure. Take them away and, and I have nothing. Take them away and, and I'm lost. These Thessalonians' lives had revolved around their idols. When you study the history of the Thessalonians, uh, they, they were an extremely idolatrous people, like the Athenians. Um, they had a plethora of idols that they worshipped, and they trusted these idols to provide everything they needed in life. They really did trust in them and looked to them to meet their needs. They depended on their idols to provide health. And they had other idols to provide security. And other idols that, that guaranteed food. And other idols that, that were protection for them. Uh, other idols that gave them love and happiness. And other idols that they looked to for wisdom and so on. Their life revolved around these idols that met their needs and gave them fulfillment and purpose. And the expression that we read there in verse 9, that you turned to God, singular, from idols, plural, describes a radical life change. It describes repentance. It describes a 180 degree turning away from dead things that cannot satisfy to the one true living God. What everyone found so astonishing was that these Thessalonians turned away from all their idols. They abandoned them all in exchange for putting all of their trust in one invisible, intangible God. And they trusted him alone. And the amazing thing was they were joyful. They were rejoicing. They were energized. They had a life that they had never seen in them before. They turned away from false idols to the true God. And they were joyful. They turned away from many sources of supply to one God, Jehovah Jireh. And they were joyful. They turned away from visible gold and silver that they could touch and control to an invisible God whom they had to yield control to. This is perhaps the hardest to give up trust in cold, hard cash that you can, that you can manage and you can control and handle in exchange for trusting in a God who asks you to give him control and you can't see him. And they turned away from man-made security to God, the creator of all. Serving these idols and the demonic powers that were behind them had held control over all the people of the region for centuries. The worship of these idols affected every aspect of their culture, every aspect of their lives, every aspect of their relationships. And therefore, in turning from their idols, 
their many idols. They were giving up their culture. They were giving up their way of life. Often they were giving up their status and their position in society and even many times giving up their place in their family as they were given the boot because of their turning to God. They were voluntarily becoming social outcasts because the power of God had opened their blinded eyes to see that God was what their hearts yearned for, that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment and the satisfaction of all they needed. If we truly turned away from our idols, those things that we trust in, those things that give us fulfillment and joy and satisfaction in life, how would that impact us? And how would it impact the way others view us? Would they think you're crazy? And yet the gospel calls us to let go of all those other things you are trusting in to give you life, to give you joy, security, and exchange it for trusting in the only one who is the way, the truth, and the life. The life that you have always longed for. And Jesus said, if anyone would be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, death to all those other things and follow me look closely at the last part of verse 9 again you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God you turn to God to serve the living and true God and remember that they did it with joy We studied in um, Galatians what the New Testament, New Covenant serving God looks like. It is depending upon him for everything, but yielding to him everything that through you he might be all that he wants to be in reaching out to, to those around you. These Thessalonians did not become passive Sunday morning Christians. It wasn't just Sunday morning that that God was their focus. Sunday morning, God was their all in all. They put aside everything else that God became everything seven days a week. This is what happens to us when, when, when what, or sorry, what happens to us when we have other idols in our life is that we become Sunday morning Christians or maybe Sunday morning Christians and Monday morning for that half hour devotion, Tuesday morning for that devotional time, uh, Wednesday morning, Thursday, if I've made it this far in the week. And, but that's it, just these little slivers of our day when, when that is, that God is our focus and then we put him aside And our focus becomes all these other things that we pursue. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Which one are you loyal to? And which one is despised? Which one is a chore and which one is your joy? You cannot serve both God and mammon. You cannot serve both God and anything. This is why many do not really enjoy the Lord. This is why many find their spiritual life empty and dry because they have not let go of other idols. There are other things they are still pursuing in life for security and happiness. 
Are you still trying to find life in something out there? And what we are talking about in here is keeping you away from what's out there. And so, uh, can you get on with it? I want to get back out there. Are you trying to find life in something other than Jesus Christ? Or have you come together because you're excited to be together with other brothers and sisters who have a kindred spirit, who have a kindred passion, who have the same passionate love, who have the same obsession with Jesus Christ, who long to talk about him, who, who long to sing to him, who long to, to share their stories about what he's doing in their life and, and long to learn more from one another about how to go deeper. Check your heart. And you will see that you are loyal to one and despise the other. Some long for, for times of fellowship with brothers and sisters. Some long for times when they could get into the word. And those other things become necessary we're sent out into the world. But oh God, my heart is with you. My heart is with your people. My passion is the things of God. But because these Thessalonians turned from their idols, they were able to be passionate servants of Jesus Christ, serving in the power and the joy of the Holy Spirit. And they're spreading the gospel everywhere at great personal expense. Not because they've been given an assignment, but because it is what they talk about and you can't shut them up. They're spreading the gospel by simply telling about the goodness of God, telling their testimony, what God has done in their lives. And let me tell you what we've heard. Let me tell you what we've learned. Let me tell you what it's done for me. Not just sharing with friends and neighbors, but in their joy about Jesus. They are traveling from city to city and village to village, looking for those who have not yet heard and spreading the gospel, and sharing their testimony of how they have turned from many idols that could never satisfy to serve the one true God that is fulfilling and joyful. And those who heard could see, man, you've got something I want. You've got something I've been looking for. They could see that these Thessalonians were truly more joyful with their one God than they were with their many idols. And to claim to have turned to faith in God is a delusion if you are not in faith serving the God whom you have turned to. It is the indwelling life of Jesus who compels us and empowers the child of God to find great joy in being about his father's business the Bible says that faith without works is dead. Well, the faith of these Thessalonians was anything but dead. It was alive. Look to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In 2 Corinthians, we have some examples of what's going on among these Thessalonians. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. This group of churches, the Macedonian churches, included the Thessalonians and those that they had the most powerful, profound influence on in the area of Macedonia. That was where this revival is going on and breaking out. And so Paul, he's writing here to the Corinthians... He's writing uh, from Ephesus, and um, verse 2, he says, In the midst of a very severe trial, 
their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty. Uh, so the extreme poverty came about as a result of their persecution. But their overflowing joy and extreme poverty in the midst of severe trial welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. And we didn't have to ask them for it. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, uh, also to us. And then chapter 11, and verse 9, And when I was with you and needed something... I was not a burden to anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. They're, they're supplying my needs. And as you read it on in the book of Acts and some of the letters that Paul writes, the beginnings of the letters, the people that he mentions in them, his traveling companions, from this point in, in history onward, his traveling companions were almost always included men from Macedonia. They had come alongside him. They were partnering with him in the ministry right to the end, the people from Macedonia. And look at the last part of 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 9. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, verse 10, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is considered by many to be one of the clearest and most concise descriptions in the Bible of the genuine Christian life. It is summarized with three verbs. You turned. There's a repentance. There's, there's the old that was left behind, all that I once depended on, all that I once drew life from, I turned from it. You turned from idols to serve God and to wait for Jesus' return. The works of faith and the... Um, labor of love that he talked about in verse 3 and the hope patience endurance of hope as we wait for Jesus return there's an old life that's gone I've got a whole new pursuit a whole new passion that consumes me and while I am doing this I've got an eye that's always looking for the return of my master, the return of the groom, to wait for Jesus. This was the motivating hope of these believers. And uh, Lord willing, we'll spend a little more time next week looking at this. But they were waiting with expectancy for Jesus who had risen from the dead, who had gone to heaven to prepare a place for them, to prepare a place for all of us. And like a bride waiting eagerly for her groom to come back as he promised so that he would take them with him out of this pain-filled, damaged, sinful world where, where he's assigned them to, to be about the Great Commission. He's coming, though. He's promised them, I'm coming. One of these days, one of these days, you're going to hear my voice. And I'll say, come, time's up. We're going. It's taking you home out of here and that was the yearning and the longing and that was what kept them going from day to day in the face of all of this with joy and expectancy this is the hope of every believer that this painful world is temporary and we are here in the power of his spirit who will never leave us or forsake us. But we are here to set captives free. We are here to open blind eyes. We are here to proclaim good news to the poor. But all the while we are here, we know in the back of our mind, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And he's going to deliver us. 
not only from the troubles of this world, but especially we are delivered from the judgment that God is going to bring upon this world, referring to uh, the wrath to come. And uh, Lord willing, next week we'll take a closer look at verse 10. But uh, let's look back at some of the questions we asked at the beginning regarding persecution. And, and I pray as you read these verses that there's something in heart, inside your heart that just begins jumping and begins chomping. And just, Lord, yes, Lord, I want to be like that. Shape me, mold me, make me like that, Jesus. Conform me to, to the likeness of Jesus Christ that I see expressed in these people and the passion for Christ. Deliver me from, from passivity. Deliver me from complacency. Deliver me from, from being bored with anything of God. Lord, strip away those idols that come between you and me. You say that I can't serve both God and anything else. I'm having trouble serving God, I'm having trouble with that desire for God, Lord, that's evidence that there's something else in my life that you need to strip away and remove, that my passion might be Christ. In light of what we've just seen of the Thessalonian example, how can we answer these questions? How should we respond to opposition? How should we pray for those who are persecuted for their faith? And does opposition to the gospel stop the spread of the gospel? Much depends on how the church responds to that opposition. Let us not respond with fear. Let us not respond with shrinking back but recognize that the church first began in a context of hostility, in a context of persecution, opposition, and those were some of the best years in the history of the church. And the church spread like wildfire across the entire Roman Empire under extreme persecution and hostility. And the Lord is going to continue to build his church. The Bible says he's coming back for a glorious church. He's coming back for a blood-washed church without spot or wrinkle. And may the yearning of your heart be, Lord Jesus, I want to be part of that. And if you are part of that, let that be great cause for rejoicing. Let us not respond with fear. We should respond to opposition with prayer and praise, like Paul and Silas did in the jailhouse in Philippi, like the apostles did in Acts chapter 4, verse 29 to 31. I'm going to take a moment and just quickly read that. They have been beaten or threatened, I guess, in this case, threatened, opposed, told to to stop the proclamation of the gospel, threatened with a beating, and they rejoiced and praised the Lord in a prayer meeting, and then they said, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. When they've told us to stop, may we speak your word because you are our master, by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That's the way we need to pray in the face of opposition. That's the way we need to respond to opposition. And let this influence the focus of our, of our prayer meeting today at 1 o'clock as we are gathering to pray for the church. And finally, we ask the question, is there hope for our children's faith growing up in a hostile environment? Like the Thessalonian church, if our children are bathed in prayer, 
they have the potential to live like the Thessalonian believers and to experience greater working of the power of God and transforming of God to give them joy in their walk with the Lord than most of us experience today. Is there hope for our children? Yes, there is hope for our children. There is hope for the church. And one of the best things that could happen to the church would be for God to begin crushing the idols all around and, and destroying the idols that we have trusted in that they come between us and God. But how much better if we would cast those idols aside and if we would loosen our grip of those things that are keeping us from, from being zealous in our walk with Christ. Is there hope? There is hope. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe that this is the message that God gives us as we see storm clouds coming. How do we pray about these things? Pray that God would make us strong. Pray that God would fill us with boldness. Pray that God would fill our mouths with joyful proclamation. Pray that God would cause us to throw away those idols that we might enjoy him and trust in him alone, and that the world might be astonished to see that you don't have any of the things that we trust in and depend on, and yet you've got what we're looking for. God, let that be our testimony to this world. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would stir our hearts with desire for you, I pray that you would convict our hearts of those idols in our lives that we are trusting in, that we are living for, that we are clinging to. Deliver us, I pray, from those things. Cause us to trust you with all our hearts. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would fill your church with your boldness and your joy and your gospel proclamation that all around far and near would hear the gospel from our lips and would see the testimony of our changed lives. And Lord God, we pray that your spirit would do the work of changing hearts. We pray often for those that we are witnessing to and sharing the gospel with. And Lord, we long to begin introducing them as your new brother, a new sister to this congregation. Lord, I pray for an ingathering of harvest. I pray for the fruit of souls that have been led to faith in Jesus Christ through the working of your Holy Spirit, through your people sitting in this room today. Lord, I pray that you would send us out from here in joy, proclaiming what it is that has transformed and changed our lives. And Lord, we trust that your Holy Spirit will open eyes and will melt hardened hearts and will transform enemies into brothers and sisters, friends, and children of God. And, O oh Lord, we desire to see you working among us. We desire to see you give this vision and passion to our children. We desire to see you continue to build your church through us. Lord, we don't want to just be reading about and hearing about what you're doing in some other congregations elsewhere in the world, but Lord, here we are. Use us, send us for the glory of God, for the joy of the nations, and Father, that we might rejoice in you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.